it's been in tons of group exhibitions, including a lot here in Los Angeles, like Monte Vista Projects and TSA, uh, and at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Philadelphia. Uh, and we are very happy and proud uh, to have John with us uh, as a professor in the art program, teaching art fundamentals this semester, uh, as well as, as um, sculpture. And he is a, he's an object maker like me, so I get to see him down in the, in the sculpture studios pretty often, which is very exciting. Uh, so we're just thrilled to, to have you here tonight to tell us about what you do in the studio. Thanks, John, take it away. Cool, thanks, Ty. Thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, it's a very nice moment to collect some thoughts and images and look at work, uh, so I appreciate it. Um, yeah, as Ty mentioned, um, I'm teaching a class and I'm also uh, the studio tech, so you may see me poking around the studios. Uh, definitely stop and say hi, um, especially if you're looking for a drill or something. Um, all right, I'm gonna open up a slideshow. Uh, Ty, can you just confirm that you can see it's yeah, looking good? Good to go. Let's see. Okay. It's like go a leap of faith and, every time. Yeah, go ahead and share, and I'll I'll give you I'll let you know. Oh, here we go. Wasn't properly sharing. John, are you in your studio right now? I am. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. All right, we can see it. Thank you. Um, actually, can you see yourself still? Uh, I can see myself in the in the bar on the side. <laughs> uh, I feel like it's a leap of faith every time we go into like full screen in this like cyber zone. <laughs> uh, but as Ty mentioned, um, yeah, that awesome little introduction. Uh, what I'm talking about here is some of my work, uh, my development as an artist, uh, but also looking at and thinking about my influences and where that comes from. Um, and one thing that I kind of like to point out here is that those influences and those foundational aspects of your work, um, it sometimes takes time to understand them. Uh, or at least it took me a long time. And case in point there was, um, as a kid for a long time, I studied and performed magic, which was about the geekiest thing you could do. And thankfully I dropped it when I got to around high school. Um, but it took me a very long time to kind of realize that that was a huge influence on me and my expectations and thoughts around art and art making. Um, part of me feels like art is a, more socially acceptable form of magic. Um, but and I say that a little jokingly, but also pretty seriously. Um, when I was in about 14, I went to the MoMA for the first time and I bought three postcards. One of them was this Merit Oppenheim uh, postcard work of a fur covered saucer and mug, a little cup. Um, Another was this Balthus painting called The Street from 1933. Uh, and another was this uh, Jackson Pollock postcard um, about with, which, with an image of white light, which is a painting by Jackson Pollock. Um, I was 14 and I didn't really understand. I don't know, this was my first experience with anything remotely close to contemporary or modern art as far as I understood it. Uh, but I was very confused and very interested. Uh, and one of the things that I was most confused about um, was this big painting by Barnett Newman um, called Vir Eureka Sublimus. Uh, and I was really mad. I like saw this painting at the MoMA. It's huge. It's the size of a wall. And I got really upset. I was like, what is this? This is bogus. I don't understand why this is in a museum. Why is this important? Uh, and I came home and I was in high school and I took a sculpture class and I painted a chair blue and I ran, put a white line down the middle of it and I wrote modern art on the back of it. Um, and that was my response to this painting. Um, 
but that was also kind of the first time that I realized that painting is a di or that art making as a whole is a dialogue and the best response to an artwork is another artwork. Um, and it was this feeling that I can be in dialogue with these people that I don't know, um, but I can actually have a conversation with them, even if it's just my high school freshman sculpture class mates looking at the dialogue. Um, I was also, took me a long time to kind of understand these reference of modern painting. This is, um, in high school, I spent most of my time rowing on the water doing crew. And this is a water marker. Uh, these are used in maritime spaces um, as markers of space. So these mark out uh, in rowing at least 500 meters. So you would have these on both sides of a body of water to mark out how far you are. Um, and it took me a very long time that I'd seen these uh, every day of my life for four years and then later saw them as Barnett Newman paintings. Um, so it kind of took some time for me to start to see these connections of familiar forms in uh, these like pantheons of art. Uh, when I was 15, I went to Europe for the first time and went to Toledo and I saw this painting, uh, which is called The Burial of Count Orgaz by El Greco. And that was another of my formative like art moments. These aren't necessarily artworks I still think about regularly or make work about, but they are moments and experiences that really shook me a little bit. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and seeing this painting in this small town in Spain did something weird that I didn't understand. Uh, and again, my response to it, I didn't know what to do. Um, I drew a lot, but I didn't know like if I was gonna make another artwork about it. My only response to it was, uh, I should get a tattoo of one of these guys because that's when you're 15, you're like, that's how you monumentalize something. Um, and I didn't do it, thankfully. Um, but there was something about the body in this painting that I, I don't know, I didn't know how to respond to. Um, it confused me, but it also got me really excited. Um, I later went to college to study anthropology uh, and specifically uh, I got into a little niche of anthropology called archaeoastronomy, which looks at past cultures, um, looks at the material record of past cultures and its relation, their relationships to astronomical phenomena. So this is a, actually a little diagram of Stonehenge, which might be the most popular and well-known archaeoastronomy site in that these were structures that were built and placed in relation to the passage of time as indicated by celestial phenomena, the sun rising and setting, the moon's movements, um, so kind of like a calendar. Uh, so I started studying archaeoastronomy, and I also took a printmaking class, again, not really interested in art, made a lot of videos and when I was a kid, when I was younger, but I never thought of myself as an artist. Um, and then I took a printmaking class. And then I started to realize that maybe art was not only a good way to respond to other artworks, but also to respond to the things I was studying. Um, I was writing papers about anthropology and archaeoastronomy, but I started making things and I realized that this was another more fruitful way to respond to what I was studying. Um, and here on the left is a lithograph that I had made. Um, on the left and the right are images from a magic book about how to make a coin disappear. And in the middle is an image of uh, wartime of, of Iraq in 2005. It was like a front page image of the New York Times. Um, and it was sandwiched by this diagram of how to make things disappear. Um, so this is one of the first things that I had made and was kind of responding to the things that I was studying. Uh, at the same time, I was taking an art history class and this painting popped up again. Uh, this time it was tiny on a projection. Um, and I wasn't mad this time. Uh, I got, this time I started interacting with it in this another weird way that by hearing the context, by hearing the, um, the historical precedent and hearing all of the infrastructure around this painting, I started to engage with just an image of it in this crazy, I don't know, in this way that was making my brain fire. And it felt good. <laughs> it was something I wanted to do again. So here this painting comes up again, this tiny screen, and I'm trying to figure out why did I 
why was I so annoyed at this painting and didn't care about it in the museum? Uh, and then now I am looking at a reproductive it and like my brain firing off. Um, also later in college, certain aspects of art and anthropology started to come together. Um, I got, got a chance to do some field work as well as community work in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico uh, in Honduras. And then this is actually, I didn't know field work here at all, but I got to visit a dig at Stonehenge um, and actually see um, and meet with some of the archeologists that were working there. Uh, this was my photography professor who led a program in London, um, Lynn Underhill, who sadly passed away a couple years ago. And things started to connect this relationship between art making, anthropology, this relationship between material production and why was one, um, why was one form of material production under this art umbrella, this other one under anthropology. Uh, I also got to see uh, this show by Martin Purrier, who was a sculptor um, at SF MoMA. And that was kind of one of the last of these formative images I'm sharing because that also just kind of blew my mind in terms of his craftsmanship, in terms of his um, mythology, in the terms of history, the way he approached history. Um, it really did something to my brain. It scrambled things in a new and interesting way uh, that never left me. Oops. So I was heading into my senior year and I was trying to figure out what am I gonna make, kind of like some of you uh, art majors. And we went to Chelsea and we went around and we saw some shows. Um, and I joked that the most interesting thing that I'd seen all day was this van in Chelsea, parked in Chelsea with cement and rocks stacked up in the back. Uh, this is a little cell phone picture from 2009. Um, and then I started to realize that that actually was true. That was the most interesting thing that I had seen. And that wasn't necessarily a judgment call on the work being shown or um, in the galleries, but it stuck with me and I realized, I don't know, there was something to this. So I responded to that with a sculpture um, by taking a car, a scrapped sedan, Toyota, and I took out the engine and gutted the interior. Uh, and I stacked the inside with Pennsylvania blue stone, which happened to be the stone that the uh, Colgate, where I was at school, used for all most of their buildings, uh, including some buildings that the students had um, actually made as like a PE credit in the late 1800s. Um, so this was part of my senior project. Um, and I was really just kind of compelled by this relationship between architecture and interior space, uh, and also specifically individual space, a car being a space for an individual, uh, maybe a family unit, a couple of people, or maybe as teenagers, you and your friends, uh, but it being a certain type of space that really was interesting to me. Um, so I stacked the inside of this car with these stones, very poorly, but I did it. Um, and then uh, I had gotten a BA, uh, which meant that I had a good liberal arts education, I thought, but not a whole lot of time in the studio. And I wanted to go to grad school. I kind of abandoned anthropology and I decided I wanted to keep making art, see what happened. Uh, so I enrolled in a post-baccalaureate program in outside Boston at Brandeis. Uh, and I started painting for the first time. Um, and this was one of the earlier paintings that I had made. Um, I went straight for the big guns and started making these big paintings because they were somehow related to my body. They were somehow related to this bodily action. Um, and I also started to realize that these paintings could maybe be responses to the other artworks that I ma was making. So somehow I felt like this was a response to the sculpture. Um, I also, while I was there, met, um, had a studio visit with and met Donna Nelson, who became a huge influence on me as an artist and um, got me interested in Tyler's School of Art. Uh, and that was just a happenstance studio visit, but she kind of derailed me in a positive way. 
Um, I was still doing these like performances also, these performance images, I guess. Um, on the left, uh, this is Boston, not LA, uh, but there was snow on the ground. So I sprayed a line of uh, fluorescent orange spray, uh, spray paint. And I moved the line by scooping it up one section at a time. So at the time I was thinking a lot about how to move things, how to move heavy things, how to move, how do you move a line? Um, I was kind of, I think I was starting to think about my body and performance around these formal qualities of image making. Um, like this idea of how do you move a line? Um, and my final project I made there was again, circling back to rocks. Rocks have become something big stones become something that I've come back to quite a bit. Um, there was a big rock on campus right outside the Rose Art Museum and I wanted to move it. So again, I'm thinking about moving these heavy things. So I decided, I started digging around it um, and I started digging in this pattern and this shape that actually had to do with the way that you approach the rock so that other people when you're looking at it relates to the way that I'm digging around it. Um, I made certain decisions, which in hindsight, I'm still kind of curious about, like the decision to cart off all of the dirt that I dug out. Uh, that went to like a, another location you see. I kept the little rocks that I found on the way. Um, so I'm thinking about this performance action as an image already. Um, and then as I was digging, I got deeper and deeper and the rock wasn't moving. I also got more, more scared. I think fear is something that's very interesting in art making, uh, this idea of it being scary. And as I kept going, I realized just how huge and heavy this rock was. And I started getting really freaked out about getting crushed by it. But I kept going um, and I found out that there was another rock underneath it, which I felt like was a very poetic ending. I decided to take that as a cue to stop. Um, but it did leave this situation, this like art site, right? It's like an installation kind of, but it's more of a performance than an installation. So it's this like art site. This was the way I was thinking about it. Um, and I really loved how as you walked up the hill, there's a hill in front of it. As you walked up it, the slope of where I dug down allowed you to come up and become eye level with this rock uh, from about 40 feet away. So then I kind of realized the most interesting thing that I did was I made this rock float. So I kind of felt like I pulled off a magic trick. I made this rock levitate a little bit. Um, I then left and was living in New York, working at a museum and I did not have the same space that I had there. I didn't have the same access to like uh, sites and spaces as, as I did before. So I kind of had to like resolve my thinking and issues with this previous project, again, by making another artwork, in this case, another painting. So I made this painting uh, in, my, in my apartment in New York as a response to that performance installation project. And I guess I was interested in the chasms between doing something and then doing something again in another form and how that translation and mistranslation opens up and what does it create? Um, I kept making more rock art for a better, lack of a better term. This on the left-hand side was, I called it my walking rock painting. It's like a walk that grew these ski pole legs and started walking off. Um, this is an outline of one of the megaliths, the rocks in um, Chelsea that Joseph Boys put up made of basalt in his Thousand Rocks, Thousand Trees project. Um, and then I started making these paintings that kind of were intended for spaces. So these weren't necessarily object or images or paintings that could exist in this uh, supposedly neutral space with white walls. Uh, but I started making paintings that meant to live somewhere. So on the left is a painting that I made for above a bed. On the right is a painting that I had made um, that was meant to be installed at eye level next to a door or an entryway. And that is uh, 
on the left, it's acrylic in oil, I think, on canvas. On the right, that's a oil paint on wood. Uh, here, I made a painting of a mirror, uh, which was gray paint on linen on a plywood to the same dimensions of this mirror below. So I started replicating spaces and making, remake, making these things, these interior domestic spaces became kind of my sites. They became my zones where I was making work for them, for other people, mostly friends. Um, and then I went to Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. Um, and it was back to these like kind of sterile environments, these galleries, these are critique spaces. So the spaces that you would maybe make work and show it in. Uh, but I just kept responding to the spaces themselves rather than necessarily making things that should go in there. Um, which becomes trite after a while. It's a little bit of an empty hall of mirrors, but some interesting things kind of started to come of it. Um, on the right, I, this was called Red Wall. Um, I was painting these blocks in a wall that I was already kind of interested in how they might collapse into an image. So how this would appear as an image of a room with these red stripes, which then turned into this painting on plywood, uh, which then I chopped up and rearranged into this painting. Um, this is like house paint, I think, on plywood. Then I put that in a different room, which turned into something else this smaller discrete object in this big white room with this red box in the middle. Um, so these things, they kind of became like onions where like a space turned into an object, turned into a new space, turned into a new object. and kind of just kept folding into themselves in this way. Um, at the same time, well, in grad school, I got very interested in, um, for lack of a better word, this idea of the socialist object, which comes from productivist Russia, in the early 1900s, 1916, 17, and in, leading into the revolution. Um, and this idea was hypothesized later by a Russian theorist of the socialist object, which was um, what some of these artists were thinking about. Uh, making art as labor, making art as social labor, making art as not designers of things to be looked at in this um, possessive way, but artists are making things that then have a social function, that then actually can maybe change the way that society is organized, um, which there's since then been fields of artistic production around. Um, but there's something really interesting about that. There's since the, to me, because they were positing this idea that maybe we make things, not only artworks, but also objects, tools that are um, not possessions, but our comrades. So this idea of living alongside the objects that you make and you use. Obviously this is a, um, this is a, uh, this is a way of relating to the world that is not possession bound, um, but it's something that I got very interested in. So I made this sign uh, in the tool crib at Tyler because tools were walking off, they were disappearing. So I made a sign that says tools as comrades, not possessions. Um, I don't know if it worked, but I like to think it did. Um, and then again, leading into a senior show, um, or a thesis show in this case, um, I was thinking about, as I had mentioned, the social function of art, the social function of art that is not necessarily socially oriented in a way. Um, and I decided there's this big rock uh, at a Home Depot parking lot that I had been watching for a few months and documenting and kind of keeping an eye on, almost like I was observing it. Um, and I decided I wanted to move that rock into the gallery space. Uh, the thesis show, but I couldn't because the rock was heavy and the floors of this of the student gallery were hardwood. They're really nice, beautiful hardwood. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. 
um, I started to kind of have this feeling that the expectations around us as art students were to make these things um, that the exhibition space couldn't handle. And I meant that really uh, literally in this case. Um, I wanted to move this rock into this gallery space and the studios were made of concrete floors. They had gantries, they could lift two tons. They were like outfitted for heavy lifting. Uh, and then I was trying to extrapolate that a little bit to the theoretical or social heavy lifting that we were kind of expected to do. But then we kind of ended up in this nice space that could not support the weight of the things we were making in the studios. And then also as an extension, I was thinking about how they couldn't necessarily support the weight of the things that we were trying to do with our work. So in place of the rock, I hung, I put this gantry, um, which was a one ton gantry. And I made these paintings and drawings and lamps around it uh, that were all about the space. I was making these paintings and drawings about the space. And each one of these had a different style to it. I was really kind of wanted to like interrupt the idea of like a stylistic practice. Um, they were kind of each different moves that like they're from different artists or something. Um, and I made the gantry float. Again, a little bit of a magic trick. Um, but this idea of the gantry was kind of ill-equipped to do the heavy lifting that was kind of expected of us, or expected that we wanted it to do. Um, so then I made these kind of design looking objects, sculptures uh, that were illuminating these paintings about the space that it was, that you were standing in. Um, and then these drawings of the space that you were in also. Um, the paintings I felt like failed miserably. The, draw, the sculptures, lamps were interesting and set me off on a new path, but the drawings I actually still really loved. These drawings of the spaces. Um, after Tyler, I moved to Los Angeles and I did a road trip on the way as every great move requires. Uh, and one of the stops along the way that, I, that we made was at Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Um, and this is a site of importance for um, indigenous cultures because it was kind of very cosmopolitan. There's a lot of different cultures that met at this one space. Um, and one of the things that I kind of, this is just a, an image of the round architectural spaces that they created. I loved. Um, and one of the first shows that we did that I did when I moved to Los Angeles was at Tiger Strikes Asteroid in Los Angeles. Um, again, instead of adding an object to the space, um, I was currently renovating a studio studio that had these reflective tile ceilings tiles. Uh, and so my participation in the project was to remove the ceiling of the gallery and to put this reflective um, ceiling in, in its place. So this was my work on the left. Uh, the ceiling is my work, this reflective ceiling. So I liked this position of not necessarily adding a thing to be looked at, but a thing to kind of inform things that were already there. And I like this doubling of the space this opening up to the heavens, this like higher ethereal otherworldly space. Um, but then also still some discrete objects. Um, this is rope that had been coiled that I then bound with thread. Um, I then did a project at another artist run gallery called Central Park, um, which was in downtown Los Angeles uh, in the jewelry district. And it was in a busy building with lots of floors, busy hallways. Um, and I decided to make the show about largely about drawings. So I hung a lot of drawings that I've been making. Uh, drawings were still kind of the foundation of my work. Um, I don't often show them, but I decided to show a ton of them in this case. Uh, and I put them all in the hallway, which was this kind of public 
not public, but semi-public space where all the inhabitants of the building could interact with them. Or I don't know, I just wanted to see what happened when they were there. And then the gallery itself, um, I emptied. The gallery didn't put any objects in there. We also took the door off of the gallery space and just left this mesh outer door so you could always see into it. Um, and I painted the gallery. Um, I painted specifically the support beams. So these were cement, these cement structure of the entire building, the entire high rise that was kind of visible on the interior space of the gallery space itself. Um, the spaces, the walls, the surfaces were painted the same color, um, depending on which way they faced. So I'm thinking about orientation. I'm thinking about um, the way that we orient ourselves interiorly in a space, but also exteriorly. Um, and also this is the way that this was painted and made also has some references to art historical, um, a lot of art historical projects, including Barnett Newman a little bit with these stripes on the right, but also uh, some constructivist ideas and the steel design ideas. So I was very interested in kind of this line between art, these lines between art and anthropology. Where do we make these lines and why? Um, following this project, I did uh, some set and objects um, with a dancer choreographer named Allison Damadu, who I ended up getting married to. Um, so we collaborated extensively after that, uh, but not a whole lot on art. Uh, this is the one major project that we actually collaborated on. Um, but again, thinking about the body in the space, the body interacting with these objects that I had made. Uh, these ob objects as co-performers. Um, these objects that could move, that could change, um, and be alongside people in this way, this socialist object way a little bit of cohabitating. Um, and then another friend, or a friend in this project in the back left, Jamie Felton, as a painter, uh, and I kind of make these points because a lot of times when I'm watching these projects, these artist talks in retrospect, everything is so nicely or like lined up and it is a beautiful linear trajectory of an artist's career. Um, and that's at least not how I experience it. A lot of it is just happenstance in the way that things kind of unfold into another. Uh, so in this case, this, um, in the back left, Jamie Felton was a painter friend who happened to be dancing in here, um, who then made some paintings on the right. Uh, that was in another artist-run space project at a space called Barbers. Um, and I was thinking about the conditions of making and viewing art in Los Angeles. This is now like 2015, 2016. Um, I also at the time was working at the Fowler Museum at UCLA, which is a museum dedicated to anthropological objects for the most part. Um, and I thought it was very interesting how at UCLA, there was one museum that was the hammer for contemporary art. And there was another museum for anthropological work. However, there were still contemporary artists working in both spaces. Um, and I found that kind of problematic, um, and, but I was still interested in these lines between when is an art object no longer uh, within the umbrella of contemporary art or modern art or art? When does it start to slide into anthropological object? When does it start to slide into cultural affect? When does it start to slide into um, Yeah, when does it start to move out of that space? So. For this project, Jamie Felton made these paintings. Um, and what's interesting about a lot of these artists from spaces is that um, they're small, they're community-based, and a lot of people mostly see the work at night at an opening. 
So I was using these conditions for the project. In this case, I made lamps to light up Jamie's, Jamie's work uh, because it was mostly being seen at night or during the opening. Um, and these were also lamps from the Fowler Museum. So I was curious about what happens when I cast the lens of an anthropological lens on this young artist's work. How do we maybe look at it differently? How can we decentralize ourselves or the artist, denaturalize it a little bit, and look at it within context of a greater, of a larger culture? So these art objects, these paintings are operating, not just Jamie's, but it was an example of objects that operate within an art world and have very specific functions, have very specific um, capital, different forms of capital, monetary, social, um, old, young. But then I was trying to kind of like remove, zoom back a little bit and think about, well, how does this fit into a larger idea of material culture right now? So I tried illuminating her paintings with this anthropological lens, kind of literally. Um, all this time, I was also making a lot of video work. Uh, which I showed a little bit with a collective. Um, and I like video because it's kind of made for the screen. So looking at it over screen is kind of like the primary way of seeing it. Um, also looking at, but I also really liked having it in space. So on the right is an example of a video work that I had at um, projects with a lot of artists, fantastic project called Spring Break. And I started also turning the lens towards myself a little bit more, uh, watching myself working in the studio, watching myself doing things. Um, I was using video as this ethnographic medium a little bit, meaning as this uh, subjective, um, as a subjective viewer of something else and try not to bring my own objectivity to it. Uh, but then I started to have to like be a little more reflexive about that um, because anthropology as a subject is very interesting, but as a like one of the problems that started to develop in the past 10, about, about the past decade is basically anthropology as an extension of uh, white supremacy and as, a, as an extension of um, uh, Eurocentric, Anglo-Eurocentric worldviews, which it was used for a while. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, anthropology was kind of born out of trying to show how certain cultures or certain people are superior than others. Um, and thankfully, we've moved pretty long ways out of that, but still a European American idea of anthropology is largely white people studying non-white people. Um, so I started to look a little bit more at the act, the anthropological lens itself, so rather than using it as the lens to look at these things, I kind of wanted to think about it a little bit more reflectively, a little bit more about how can I maybe look at myself in that same way. So I was making video. Uh, I also started making these sticks, these scale sticks. Uh, which operate a little bit as paintings, but they're also operating for me as references for other things. I was making these scale sticks. Um, they're often used in photographing objects um, to demonstrate scale uh, at uh, digs and archeological sites that are used, uh, but they're also used in crime scenes um, to document the size of things, what's going on. Um, and they're kind of like trying to push against photography's um, ability to kind of take scale out of the equation. So I was making these scale sticks and I was just kind of documenting what was going on in my yard, in my house. Limbs were fall tree limbs falling, birds nests being formed and stuff dropping, palm tree fronds. I just kind of started documenting my own world my own yard. And then I started documenting other artwork. So this is an artwork on the left, my scale, my, my scale stick, 
Um, but when put next to another artwork, it starts to behave a little differently. It starts to act and function as something else. I see them as starting to point backwards towards these other things. Um, I also really like the way that they relate to photography in that they are super textured and they're actually like gunky and they're actually very um, not smooth. But when you take a picture of it, they kind of get smoothed out, turn into something else. They're still handmade. There's still these affects, cultural affect, I guess, of my own production. So that was kind of my answer to these like group shows that are popping up all the time in Los Angeles, um, where you were basically meant to make an avatar of yourself and then put it in a group show uh, where they can hang out with other avatars of other people. Uh, and then you add in social media and it really, I don't know, I was finding it very problematic uh, and uninteresting. So I made these as my solution to like the Instagram group show where you saw it over Instagram and everyone was there uh, over as artwork. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't take off. So I wasn't invited into a whole ton of shows with them. And I haven't been able to see them operate the way I wanted to, but they did move around and they got, you know, they're in some shows. Um, and I, I don't know, they're kind of little experiments. I just wanted to see how they behaved with other objects. Did they behave well? Did they misbehave? Were they annoying? Were they nagging? Um, so then I started the scale idea in applying it to other objects. On the right, these are Nordic skis uh, that I put some scales on the bottom of. Um, and then around this time, um, I was invited, uh, I got a grant to do a project um, revisiting the wall painting project that I shared earlier. Um, and so I was revisiting that project and thinking about how scale may be factored into that project in new ways that I didn't understand before. So I started making little mo models, maquettes of that space and turning it into an object instead of a space so instead of like a space for a body to inhabit, these were objects for a body to be around, thinking about interiority and exteriority. Um, and then this was in February of last year. Uh, and then COVID hit, um, which kind of canceled a lot of things. Um, and this project, which was meant to be in a space, had to go operate a little bit differently. Um, so instead, I brought it back to the studio and I was working with these scales, or sorry, these models. Um, here's the original installation again. And I decided to make a video um, as a response to this work on the right. So I'm gonna share a sh quick snippet of the video right now. Here we go. Uh, so this is six minutes and then I'll breeze through the last couple of images of what I've been up to recently uh, and call it there. So yeah, this is a quick six minute uh, snippet of a longer video that I am still kind of working on, but it's getting to be finished. <sighs>
think uh, oops. Um, Ty, how are we doing on time? I had a couple images of recent stuff, but I'm also happy to cut it there. Keep going. Or okay. Uh, okay, so let's see where were we? Sorry, one second. Okay, so yeah, this interior painting space then became a stage for me um, for my practice. And then the practice space around making things, becoming this bigger performance in the show. Um, yeah, this is very new, this is fresh. So I'm still processing, trying to figure out exactly what's going on, but um, there is a longer video um, that goes along with that. Uh, and then just some of the things I've been up to since then. So this is like the past year uh, in the studio, making some stuff, still thinking about image, scale of an image, um, the way it organizes space, the way that an artwork or an image uh, can operate in the background to be something that other things are measured against. And the way that like it can be used to detect movement and detect change. Uh, I started putting these scales into rocks um, and I got super interested in craft has never been like a subject that I've been particularly knew how to like address or incorporated my work in terms of like art making. Uh, but I started getting very deeply interested in um, rock and stone carving. Uh, not quite like figurative carving, make a body out of rock, but actually like stone inscriptions. So the way that uh, monuments and rocks, and gravestones especially have been, are carved with lettering. So rock cutting uh, and tech, some masonry techniques. Um, what happens, I don't know, these are, I guess, scales that are trying to detect like the interior space of these things. They get sunken down. Uh, and then also starting to combine this painting object with rocks. Over the past year, I think everyone's been thinking about monuments and monumentality and how do things stay after you or a historical event and explain what happened or don't explain what happened, but give a narrative that you want to control. Uh, I also really like rocks, I've realized over time, because they're in between being a place and a thing. When they're this big, they're a thing. When they get really big, they become a place. And I think that's very interesting, that slippage. Um, how do you turn it into a tool? How can a place become a tool? I felt social media, I was thinking a lot about how social media is a tool, um, but it's becoming a place to go to rather than becoming a tool to use, which relates back to um, the idea of a socialist object. Uh, and then here, relating to uh, what I mentioned about rock carving, also been working on learning Trajan brush stroke lettering. This is some of the first, um, some of the first uh, still intact um, lettering of this, of our alpha, this alphabet um, and how that became formalized and how lettering allowed language to be reproduced. These are made with a brush flattened out. Um, but learning how to, I've been teaching myself how to make, how to do uh, Trajan brush letters. And these things are starting to come together in interesting ways. Um, I guess I've been thinking a lot also about language recently. Um, language and monumentality, language and art. Uh, I think the times when I find most are most successful and most interesting. And again, buzzing is when language starts to fail. And then this art thing starts to kick in. Um, 
And yeah, that kind of brings us up to now with a couple of sketches of what I'm up to. And that's it. Thanks you guys so much. Thanks for letting me run over. And uh, I don't know, Ty, do we have time for questions or if there are any? Uh, yeah, that was, that was great, John. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I think we definitely have time for questions if, if, uh, if you have time and if yeah. people need to, if people need to go, they can, they can go. Um, yeah, let's see. I can't see everyone. So, uh, yeah, if you have, if you have questions for John, go ahead and, oh, there we go. Um, ask away. Um, I did have one question uh, with your scale that you were kind of experimenting with. Did you, just more of like a, like a picking your brain kind of question and how yeah. like you were just kind of testing how people reacted to them and how they react to the different artwork you kind of put them in. I was curious, did you ever explore like the area of using those scales, but taking only photographs of the scales next to artwork and then making that your art piece collectively because mm -hmm. for me when i was looking at your art piece and you showed you know a picture uh, of the snap uh, 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 sorry i think i cut out no it, it's sorry i'm back what was the last part Zeke? um because for me when i saw your your scale and the photograph of it next to the artwork. I, for me personally, really liked that. I thought visually it was very like pleasing and it, it, it can't quite put words to it, but I just thought that was a very clean kind of like total art piece. And I thought like, if you ever thought about doing that or explored that and what your um, feedback on was it. I love that idea. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hold on to it. I. Um... No, I haven't because I tend to think about the way that these art objects operate in different arenas and different spaces, almost like in different theaters. Um, there's the like primary experience of being there and seeing the thing, but then also the way that we interact with art now through uh, screens, through all sorts of screens, email, social media, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, that's a different type of primary experience. So in a way, I think I feel like seeing it as an image on a website or on Instagram has kind of become the primary experience of seeing it actually. So in a way, I think it's kind of already doing that in that like, I don't know, somebody, I was listening to an interview and someone said something very smart. And that was, um, that was that museums are becoming a little bit obsolete because the analog experience of being at a museum is becoming secondary to seeing it digitally. So we see things digitally, we see things via screens, and that becomes our primary experience. And then when we go and we see the thing in person, that becomes our secondary analog simulation of it. It becomes like a simulation of seeing it originally. And that's why I was making those things in order to operate within like the screen realm. Uh, but your idea to take that image and then put it into a physical space, I love, I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Kira. Um, thanks, John. That was, it was really amazing to hear your arc and I thought you were super generous and kind of showing all the like little streams that run into the river for Thanks everyone. So. Thanks, Kira. Um, I'm curious about um, just how you, I think you've done a really lovely job of sort of, yeah, sharing influence in all sorts of ways. And I, I think I'm, I'm curious about like, how you might describe your relationship to influence or how you're feeling about it right now, like contextually. Yeah, yeah complicated. <laughs> it's, um, you mean in terms of like artistic influence as a 
as an entity or any influences right now? I think I was trying to go a little bit broader than just art historically. There's, you know, kind of beyond anxiety of influence, which I think all artists deal with understanding kind of like the, the beauty and curse of having a context around your work and playing. But I think you more than most people that I have listened to lecture about their work recently are sort of like calling it out very specifically um, and sort of actually in dialogue with it, like wanting to have a conversation with the art historical reference or wanting to have a conversation with the idea of like you were talking about socialist um, or constructivist art, like the, the kind of conceptual um, conversation between artworks has been kind of an important part of your work throughout. So yeah, I'm curious how, uh, how you're feeling about influence at this very moment. And then if that extends outside, um, you know, the art historical world for you. And if so, how much? Sorry, my it's cutting in and out, so I'm going to talk for a second as I get closer to my zone. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the more difficult things that I've kind of worked through was coming out of anthropology and that being like a source as a subject uh, to work off of. Um, I very kind of you know, not as quickly as I would have liked, but I realized that I was a white guy making work about non-white cultures. Um, and that is highly problematic and that, um, so I think there are times where influence is, I don't know. Hi, I'm back and close. Uh, there are times where I feel like it can be named and it should be named and it makes it richer. There are also times when, I don't know how to explain it besides like, you dare not like speak it. And I don't mean just an artwork or another artist or something like, Someone who I didn't show at all was Blinky Palermo, who was an artist who like a lot of those things look a lot like. So there's some anxiety about that. Um, but it's also someone who like, you know, I've kind of researched and done some writing about, and I feel like a strong relationship with. Um, and so I th think that it is extremely rich to be in dialogue with other artists. I think sometimes um, we fall, I think, a lot of artists fall under the problem of putting their work next to other art in order to gain some sort of capital or some sort of like, you know, by association of. Um, and I think that's, I don't know, I think most people can see through that pretty quickly and can see when there is or is not some sort of a generative um, relationship. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, influence. There are certain things that like I can't, that my work is about that I can't talk about, that I can't name. If I say it out loud, it's like, it. there are certain things that are so profound that if as soon as you say it out loud, it flattens, it gets deflated and it's gone. And I think I'm trying to like go towards that. <laughs> That's the thing that I'm like trying to constantly get closer to. Um, and then in the meantime, um, I try to use influence, like the, I try to call attention to influence because, um, yeah, in order to just create a richer dialogue, in order to take something and say like, this is the precedent of leading up to it. And this is how I'm interacting with it. Um, I also, I don't know, I guess there's a, there's a hope that maybe naming it, talking about it is a way of moving against this like, settling, colonizing of other things and holding on to it. But um, I also don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I rambled for a second there. It no, is- It's just so awesome. It's such a, it's such a like important thing, I think also as a teacher to discuss that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think yeah, contextualizing your work and being able to name, it takes a long time in order, to, I think it takes a long time to like name, to understand those influences. And that's why I kind of started off with some work that like my work doesn't really look like, or I don't think about that often, but it's somehow embedded itself so deeply in my brain um, that it comes out. And I think that happens to everybody regardless of whether you know it or not. So you might as well be as like aware of it as possible. Um, 
I wrote down a really good note recently about influence. I can't find in my notebook, but it was really witty. I promise it was cool. <laughs> uh, that's an awesome question. Thank you. All right, thank you. I've got a vacuum and kids in the background, so I'm sorry if it's loud. Um, but John, thank you so much. I, I kept, when, especially when you're talking about your rocks and moving heavy things, I kept thinking about the, the Kennedy moon quote, you know, where he's like, we're going to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. I won't do my <laughs> Kennedy impression, but, um, but I, I highly encourage you to uh, act out that scene now that you've mm -hmm. taken on more acting roles in your work. Mm -hmm. uh, you could add that to it, um, to your, to your talk. I was Thank loving you. the, I mean, I loved that you kind of ended with the, with the video and that you, and that you've, you've sort of, um, it, it seems like so much of your work, like throughout this arc is, is dealing with like, uh, I don't know, like, like illusions, like magic, you know, we, I, I started by reading that part of your bio that you, um, that you were into magic as a kid and it seems you know that you've embraced it at times and then at other times with your with your sticks with your scale sticks that you're like calling out falsities in the world mm -hmm. in like image making or, or something um, I just love that like ongoing I don't know like um, just naming of of how we're how we are translating information as we take it in uh, and then how you are, are translating elements of, of your, um, your physical practice or your physical proximity to, to the world. Uh, it's just a, um, you know, it's a, it's fantastic for us to be able to hear, uh, how you've navigated that in, in really such thoughtful and nuanced ways in your career. Um, I just really appreciate that. So Thanks, thank you so everybody. much. I really appreciate that insight. Um, yeah, I think uh, piggybacking off of what you said and what Kira said originally, I think something funny, it's really nice to like, to witness influence in your own work and then to have the aha moment of like, oh my God, that's where that came from. And then once you name it, you're like, what do I do with it now? You then are kind of in this like, it's really cool to be like, there's the work and then there's the influence and you notice it, but then you become a part of this like threesome and you're like, I don't know how to, manage this <laughs> um and uh, i don't know cool awesome totally all right thank you john all right thanks you guys really appreciate it